Glad to have you with us this morning on this July 19th. Uh, I am currently in New Jersey, where I will be preaching for my son-in-law's ordination service. Um, Pastor Keith Brutlag will be doing your live service here on Sunday morning, but uh, I will be covering uh, for our online service today. So glad to have you with us as we come together to worship and to praise our Lord and Savior. Now let us begin with our opening hymn. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give ear, O Lord, to the prayers of your people, and listen to their cry for mercy. Lord of mercy, we confess that with us there is an abundance of sin, but in you there is the fullness of righteousness and an abundance of mercy. We are poor sinners whose thoughts, words, and deeds betray our weakness and death. You, O Lord, are gracious and merciful, and through Jesus Christ our Lord, you have saved us by his blood. Give to us true repentance that we know your forgiveness and the comfort of a clear conscience. Give us also hearts made new by your grace, that we love you above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. And by your Holy Spirit, do what is pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. Through the mercy of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus our Savior, you have been made the children of God in baptism and live because of his mercy. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, 
that ever mindful of your final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you in perfect joy hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the firstfruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that it is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Our Holy Gospels according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and to gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it, also, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of God will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. And we continue with our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you are fans of Monty Python. At times they can push the limit a little bit. Uh, they push me to my comfort zone at times. They can get a little bit sacrilegious at times. But they do, you have to admit, they do have a very unique style of humor. And one of their more famous scenes is uh, in the quest for the Holy Grail, uh, which involves a scene where the Black Knight is impeding their progress for the quest of the Holy Grail. So King Arthur must fight with the Black Knight in order to pass. Sir Arthur manages to cut off both arms of the Black Knight but the Black Knight was not willing to give up the fight. He says, only a flesh wound. The humor in this scene is the obvious understatement and the misplaced evaluation of the Black Knight's condition. Both arms cut off, unable to even hold a sword and he wants to continue fighting, only a flesh wound. Some in the Roman church that Paul was writing to may have thought that Paul had the same misconception. The church in its infancy faced many challenges, and the greatest one perhaps was persecution. And Paul encourages them, don't give up. It's only a flesh wound. Well, maybe those weren't his exact words, but these were. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Our readings over the last several weeks have worked us through the book of Romans. Um, this is a book that's a bit of a theological giant. 
you could almost look at it as Christianity 101 of sorts. Paul is going through the basics of Christianity. And he speaks of the law, uh, which predominated thinking in the Old Testament. Then he speaks of the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ, fulfilling the law for us in this new covenant. And now then, as Christians, we don't worry as much about the law. We have the freedom of the gospel, uh, but we are still children of God, and now he wants us to live like it. And so this reading then is considered the culmination of Romans 5, chapter 5 through 8, and this verse is the transitional hinge into this reading. We are children of God. We are heirs. But we are still waiting to receive our full inheritance. So Paul is introducing for the first time in his letter to the Romans an issue that the Romans are dealing with. And that happens to be suffering and persecution. And so Paul at this time gives his solution to the suffering. Now notice Paul's advice isn't, is, is how to endure suffering. It's not how to make suffering go away. No, you're not going to get a prosperity gospel here from Paul. And um, his answer in his solution to the suffering really is one of comparison. It's like a ledger looking at the pluses and minuses. And he says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The Christians in Rome were likely asking, you know, the question, is all of this trouble worth it? And the answer is a resounding Yes. Your sufferings, as bad as they appear, are only a flesh wound in comparison to your inheritance as a child of God. Your inheritance is, a far, is far greater than any suffering that you will ever experience on this earth. So what does that inheritance look like? Well, it will involve glory. You know, closing last week's reading of being glorified with Christ, we, we hear about that glory. Romans 8, verse 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We get to participate with Jesus in his glory. Have you ever played cards with someone? And when they win, they live in glory. Maybe gloating is a better word. But in Jesus' victory... We will live in glory and be glorified with him. Our inheritance also includes the aspect of freedom. It says we will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This image of freedom goes back to the slavery image in, in the law that was, he spoke about in earlier chapters. But we not only go from slavery to freedom, but we go from freedom to heir, which involves sonship. And this is something that we possess now, but even greater when we receive our inheritance. We inherit all the blessings which God has waiting for us. And the blessings also include a new heaven and a new earth. We've been talking a little bit about this over the last few weeks. 
we know from Scripture that our inheritance will include a, a new heaven and a new earth, although technically it will not be new, but rather it will be the old world redeemed and made new. God will purify creation from its corruption, and we will receive new bodies. And what is interesting is that it is the knowledge of this inheritance that has everybody groaning. Well, maybe we were groaning before this knowledge, but the knowledge increases our groaning. Knowing the ending and seeing the broken world that we live in at times creates impatience in us. We can't wait for our inheritance. And to some extent, it almost seems that ignorance is bliss. We all know that a child, knowing that there is a present waiting for them to open under the Christmas tree or for that birthday party, um, and, and he sees it and wants to open it, and knowing that it is there but can't be open creates anguish and growing, groaning, and it would almost be better if they didn't know it was there at all. All creation is groaning. It is the reality of the present suffering and the knowledge of future glory and freedom and a new heaven and earth that has everybody groaning, even creation itself. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. Paul is obviously using personification here. He's treat, treating creation as a person, and uh, this happens often throughout Scripture. In fact, we sing a song, um, you know, talking about trees of the field, they clap their hands. But in Romans, it eagerly awaits. You know, why is creation groaning? It is not what it was created to be. And what does it eagerly await? Well, it's restoration. And how did creation end up this way? Well, that says, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. And so what we know then is that creation was passively subjected to it. And what this points to is the curse. It was because of Adam and Eve, but it was not by him, not by Adam, but rather it was by God as a pronouncement of judgment against Adam. Adam sinned, but it was God's pronouncement of judgment on the world in the form of a curse which makes life so difficult. That is why our world is broken. That is why there is so much suffering to deal with. But Paul explains why that curse was made back at the beginning of time. He says, for the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. At the very time that the curse was pronounced by God, he also gave them hope. Genesis chapter 3 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God put the curse on the world 
the result of sin through Adam. But he also provided hope. Sin brought bondage to corruption. Jesus brought freedom and with it his glory. You know, just a few moments ago we were talking about groaning. How a child knowing knowing that a gift is available will groan while waiting. And I implied that it might even be better to not have the knowledge of that gift because ignorance is bliss. Well, I will reverse that statement. That really is not true. Because what we do need is hope. Gentlemen, I heard that when you plan to take your lovely spouse out on the town, don't hide it from her and then surprise her at the last minute. Rather, um, tell her well in advance. And the reason being is that creates hope. And it also creates anticipation of this whole time that you are waiting. And in a sense, you get more mileage out of the investment that way. But in reality, we need hope. It is our hope that creation will be set free of its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory as children of God. And it is that hope that keeps us going through periods of trial and suffering. But hope does require waiting. Because hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? And so we wait. Groaning. As we hope. Because we just want to get to our glorious destination. In the meantime, as we struggle, as we groan, as we hope, God gives us his spirit to help us through. Verse 26. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit shoulders the burden. We do not know what to speak. And it's not just an issue that we cannot put thoughts to words. We don't even know what thoughts or topics to pray about. The Spirit is the first installment of salvation. And the down payment or pledge that guarantees the remaining stages of that salvation. In wrapping up this morning, Paul demonstrates the unbreakable connection between the Christian's present status and their enjoyment of their blessings. We are his children. We will receive an inheritance of glory and freedom as we live in a renovated earth. Though you may feel like your arms are cut off at times, it is only a flesh wound. Sufferings, though real and unavoidable and painful, cannot break this connection. And it is God's Spirit that instills in us a deep sense of God's love as the basis of our hope. Let us live in that hope as we encourage each other in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we receive our offering for online worship at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, we want to remind you that our financial gifts to support what God is doing at Good Shepherd make ministry possible every day of the year, even during this time when the building must be closed. But the building is not the church. We are the church. So I invite you to help us keep the church strong. When this chaos passes, there will likely be more hurting people than ever before. And the church, including Good Shepherd, will need to be in a position to speak to that and meet those needs emotionally, spiritually, and financially. Some of you may already be struggling financially, so only if you are financially able, I encourage you to take a moment right now to make a gift to support the ministry of Good Shepherd. You can easily make a one-time or reoccurring gift by visiting our website at goodshepherdlink.org and clicking on the top of the screen in the yellow bar where it says, click here to give today. You can also mail a check to the church office at 1 Shepherd Court, Circle Pines, Minnesota, 55014. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at Good Shepherd. Let us take a moment to pray for the offering we are about to receive. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all things. You know everything that is going on in this world and in each of our lives. Please, Lord, pour out your grace today, especially to those who are struggling, and help all of us find peace and look to you in this difficult time. Bless the financial gifts that we are about to return to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, dear Lord, we are so thankful that you have your children, and that you have promised us an inheritance of glory. As we live in a world still impacted by suffering, may we not only groan as we anticipate your coming, but to your spirit rejoice even in suffering as we await our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. And we pray together the words our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.